Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Talking the Tightrope. I am James. I am the man to blame here at Tightrope. And joining me this evening is my wonderful guest, Mr. Joshua Werner. Artist, actor, author of the werewolf historical fantasy book, Rampant. He's got a lot of stuff on his plate. Uh, and he's, we, we've actually, uh, technically, although there was like an eight-year gap in between, um, we technically have been sort of doing stuff together for over 12 years now. Yeah, hard starting, to believe. Uh, yeah, starting way back when uh, Josh was a, a pimp for me. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't just any pimp. Josh was actually the king of pimps uh, in my first feature film. Uh, and at the time, I had no idea that uh, eight years after that point, while doing uh, the second season of Vampires and Bites, um, Josh had moved out of state, and then he had come back. Uh, with his family, and lo and behold, he was still up for acting, and uh, we somehow crossed paths again, and uh, the magic restarted. <laughs> That's right. Thank you for joining me tonight, Josh. How's everything going for you? Good, good. Lots and lots of good stuff going on. Super busy. Hey, always good to hear. Always good to hear. So let's uh, let's get to let's get the audience to get to know Josh Warner a little bit. Um, you really, your main, your, the core art that you're part of is uh, being a graphic artist in, in every way, shape, and form. So go ahead and tell us about um, how you got into the graphic arts. How, what actually took you to a point where uh, you decided you wanted to do that professionally? Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, ever since I was really, really young, I was, um, I was trying to draw, trying to um, create things. I always had some kind of storylines going on in my head and wanted to express myself um, from the time I was a child. And uh, when I was in high school, I was, um, I was doing really well in my classes. I was acing everything, and I was just terribly bored and wanted out of there like crazy. So I had finished up my like, high school requirements really early and um, was already set for my college prep degree before I ever had to graduate high school. So I decided I wanted to do the technical education degree on top of the college prep degree, which nobody had done that before at my school, so they didn't really know how it would work, but it did. Um, so I wanted to try drafting. It was the closest thing that they had to offer, and um, it was awful. I was really miserable in drafting, so I intentionally blew through the entire um, year's worth of work in one semester, and um, got my certificate early so that I could push the Technical Education Center to open up something a little more artistic. And so um, they did, actually. They listened. I was, one of the f I was one of the first students out of three. There was only three, and I was one of them to uh, be part of their new like visual arts program where we... Um, we learned how to paint, you know. We went to an art studio instead of the tech center. We, you know, drove our own cars instead of rode the bus, all that good stuff. And unfortunately, they pulled the funding on that after the first semester. But I was able to uh, stay on an additional semester by myself, being the only member in the tech program, because um, one day somebody went to that art gallery and they saw a painting that I was working on that I'd left there. No, I wasn't there. It wasn't school hours, but I left my art up so that I could come right back to it the next day. And they stopped and they asked whose work this was. And they were like, oh, that's just something in progress from a student who's, you know, being taught here. But unfortunately, he's only going to be around for another couple of weeks. And um, they anonymously funded, after talking with the studio, um, they anonymously funded my school to send me to that studio for another year. And so um, I managed to get uh, my certificate in that and in manual drafting and in CAD and my college prep degree. And I'd already started um, a couple college courses while I was still a senior in high school too. So I was off to a really bizarre start because all my teachers, they were pulling me away from art and everything I was doing was going towards art. And uh, I ended up deciding at that point that I wanted, um, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to go all in and went to art school. From there, uh, it was really tough for me not to go into fine art. That was what I really wanted to do. I really wanted to just be creative, paint, do the things that came to me that you know I felt passionate about. But I soon realized that um, it was way more realistic to try to train myself to do every kind of art and focus it towards a product, become product-driven. And uh, as a 
total nerd consumer, um, I saw the value in that. Even though it was working for somebody else, working on somebody else's stuff, I saw um, the pleasure that come from creating something and then seeing more than one person enjoy it. Instead of it being a painting on one person's wall, it would be a product that lots of people would enjoy. So once I kind of got over myself and the whole fine art thing, I went all in on illustration and graphic design. And uh, before I graduated college, I'd already racked up a few side jobs and was doing all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, within six months of graduating, I landed a full-time uh, in-house designer job doing designs for t-shirts and uh, marketing and all sorts of fun stuff. And I've been freelancing on top of that ever since from everything from uh, comic books to trading cards to uh, storyboards to uh, just a whole slew of things, logos, uh, random business marketing tools, like a little bit of everything. Um, and it's been good. It's pulling me in a lot of different directions, but they're all really fun, so I try to tackle all, every one that comes my way. They also help pay your rent, which is always a bonus. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so what was it that uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're getting into comic books when you were a kid. Did that sort of help um, push you towards taking your fine art in a more commercial direction? Was it sort of like, okay, I can either, you know, I can dress like Leonardo da Vinci um, and draw fantastical inventions and sketchbooks for an entire life, uh, or I can try to sort of, you know, I can sort of apply it to more commercial measures. Was that sort of informed by taking up comic books as a kid? I think yes, very much. It took me a while to really come to that conclusion. I mean, there, as a kid, I wanted to be a comic book artist. That, that was it. I wanted to draw comics. That was all I wanted to do. Uh, but by the time I was 18, that wasn't that wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. I wanted to be uh, I wanted to be crazy. And so in my illustration courses, I had uh, I would get an assignment. It would be like, okay, you're going to read this article for this magazine and you're going to do some kind of editorial illustration. You're going to have to size it, proportion it, blah, 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 to the layout for the magazine. You're going to have to work with an art director, all this stuff. And um, it, a lot of my assignments were uh, real jobs. I had to work with real places, and I wouldn't necessarily get published because every student in the class would be in the assignment, so only one would get chosen. And I was a nightmare to work with on this stuff because I started – going to school in Detroit and before I transferred to um, to the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, I was so inspired by everything I saw in Detroit that I was just all over the place. I would bring in rotted pieces of wood that I found in an alley that I thought were really cool and I was like, cool, I'm going to do the assignment on this. And my teachers would scold me and be like, no, we're not putting that on a scanning bed and get that thing out of here before you bring termites into my classroom, pull out your illustration board and your markers and do this the normal way. And I just uh, really had a hard time accepting that. But by the time I was a sophomore and I started really getting pummeled down, you know, I st and I started really remembering some of my comic book roots and remembering how much fun it was to see stuff get put in print. So, like, once I got my first um, my first couple of those, like, magazine editorial things that got printed, I was thrilled. The whole idea of going to the store, picking it up off the shelf, and looking at it, flipping through, and seeing my work was just the best feeling in the world. And uh, it really reminded me of how badly I wanted to do comic books as a kid. And um, now I'm getting back into that finally. It took a while, but I realized that I was right when I was a kid. And I was stupid when I was 18. <laughs> yeah, you should have listened to yourself as a child. Child Josh was trying to tell you what's up. Exactly. As usual, teenage Josh ruined everything. Thanks a lot, teenage Josh. Yeah, me and my big mohawk and everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, bro. Thanks a lot, your guy liner. Thanks a lot, guy liner. <laughs> Pretty sweet, bro. <laughs> All right, so what uh, what was it that got you um, right around the time? Because I, I met you right around you were 18, right? 17, 18? Uh, 16, 17, right around there. Yeah, yeah somewhere around there. So, um, what was it that, that had you want to go into doing some acting? I know you had done some other acting around before you popped up in my film, uh, but what was it that got you into doing uh, acting as uh, the, the second of your art pyramid, as it were? Um. It's, it's weird. I started doing acting pretty much as soon as I was like 
physically able. Uh, when I was a kid, I was actually born with um, uh, major complications and uh, to my brain. So um, I had a bit, I had a bad speech impediment as a kid, and I had a really difficult time uh, forming words and just you know walking, let alone doing things like drawing or acting or anything creative. But so I was really locked inside my head as a kid. Uh, unable to really communicate very well with people. I would create all these kind of fantasy stories and in my mind and once I was able to kind of overcome all that stuff and try out for school plays it was just the most fun in the world. Being anybody other than myself was the greatest idea ever. And uh, so I did a lot of, a lot of school plays um, which eventually led to like community theater stuff that I was doing on top of, you know, like Farsi, soccer, student council, National Honor Society, uh, weird Odyssey of the Mind stuff. So, like, I was trying to squeeze in all this room for acting, and um, I ended up, yeah, hearing about your film and going and checking out the audition and um, doing that. At the time, I was making a bunch of ridiculous films with my friends. Uh, we would steal his, one of my buddy's mom's video cameras when they weren't home and we would like <laughs> go make these awful horrible crazy jackassy videos and uh, so I was just ready for the camera <laughs> at that time and uh, yeah it was a lot of fun and I try to keep it in whenever I have the time you know to this day I still enjoy acting. Yeah as it turns out Mr. Joshua Werner has actually appeared in several tightrope productions <laughs> including Vampires and Bites, plug 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 uh, currently in its in the fifth anniversary mode right now. This week we'll actually be releasing um, season one as one continuous video with a little bit of remastering, a little bit of cleanup from the originals. Uh, so from there, um, you left Michigan for a while. Were you doing? Were you just you know living the dream out there? Were, were you doing art while you were out of Michigan? I think it was Pennsylvania. Yes, right. Yeah. So I was just outside of Philly, and um, I did. Uh, it's did mostly illustration work for bands. There's like a really big punk scene there. So um, I ended up, uh, I lost my apartment there. I ended up living in an attic of a punk band. And I would do, I would like handle their merch for their shows. And I was doing all their flyers. And uh, let All right, now see, that's just a classic story right there. <laughs> that, is, yeah, that is ye old punk story. That's awesome. So it was a great location for that too, because they, um, you know, from there I got to meet uh, Ryan Don and Bam Margera, and I got to hang out with those guys a lot, and um, they introduced me to a lot more people who needed art for bands, and um, it was fantastic because uh, it was I was not getting paid at all, but it was great to see my you know work getting used and people getting to know who I was before I got to know who they were, and uh, it was a really good feeling. But um, I didn't want to let acting go. Is still, so I started um, looking for auditions in Pennsylvania, which turned out to be a little harder than I thought it would be. But I ended up um, making the hike to Erie, which is quite a distance away from Philly. Oh yeah. But, um, I landed a role there. I got a call back, and I came. Um, I came back and did another round of auditioning and stuff, and I ended up landing a role in a movie called Schism, and uh, I made it to every shoot. Um, I remember the last the last shoot when it was all over. I had to keep my hair exactly the same the entire time. Came home, shaved my head. I was just like, ah, done with this hair. I want to do something else with my hair. I wanted to dye it, whatever. And because uh, I had to keep it black for the role, so I was dyeing my hair over and over, which is killing my hair. So I wanted to shave my head, start fresh, do something else. And I got a call two days later. They needed me to come back and reshoot stuff. And so I was like, oh, we might have to wait just a little bit. But don't worry, my hair grows really fast. Um, but the movie went on to do really well. Um, I ended up doing a piece of art that was used for the cover of the special edition, like two-disc special edition. It went on to be on Netflix for a little bit. Um, very short-lived on Netflix, though. And then it went on to win, like, nine or ten awards at film festivals, and that production company's been doing tons since, and I've always been invited to come out, but... I just don't have the time to make the drive anymore. I'm, I'm amazed I had the time then because it wasn't exactly a short uh, drive. But, um, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was doing a little bit of acting there, lots of illustration, and also I uh, was writing. I was writing quite a bit, actually, but most of the stuff I wrote while I lived there I never did anything with, to be honest. A lot of it's just kind of sitting around still to this day. Very cool. Now that actually is a great segue into the, the third point of your artistic triangle, 
Um, this is the you have a new book uh, out right now called Rampant. Uh, I, I call it like a werewolf historical fantasy. Uh, you actually have a previous book, Adoration for the Dead. Yeah, yeah. I remember the title. So I'll make sure I remember the title. Yeah. Uh, so. Right. So okay, so you're writing stuff. It, it's going into it's going on shelves. It's going into drawers. Um, tell us about what caused you to pull the trigger uh, on actually attempting to publish your first book. What was it that went from your desk drawers and your bookshelves into all right? Let's actually put this out there. It started. Um, it actually started when I was a teenager. I when I was eighteen, seventeen or eighteen. Um, a friend of mine loaned me the book Solipsist by Henry Rollins and it uh, blew my mind. It totally redefined what a book even meant to me. I was so used to prose and the narrative and and then seeing somebody create this book that was it was a whole bunch of stuff between two covers. It totally counted as a book but it was just it was like nothing I'd ever read before. Um, it was a lot of prose poetry, mostly. You know, looking back, it wasn't anything too outside the box. But at the time, it really opened my eyes, and um, I started doing something really similar, um, but in my own way. I wanted to, I wanted to create a piece of art that was a book and not necessarily a story. And um, I, I ended up self-publishing it. It took took quite a bit of work on my end to make it all happen because I didn't know what I was doing at all. But I had all this weird, bizarre stuff hidden in this, each chapter. So if you went through and just followed the bolded words only, they would create their own like subtext story going on in the background and just all sorts of really bizarre stuff. And um, I put it out. It was called The Brutality Effect. And I had posted all over Detroit these bizarre posters that would have some really strange image. And it would say The Brutality Effect on it. And then it would just have... Um, a little web address, and I would every single one was different. I posted them all over Detroit, and it was it was interesting because all that website took you to was some little free terrible site that I made that was advertising the book release party, and no somebody even knew it was a book. They had no idea. People were just saying this is really strange imagery. What's going on here? And so I rented a building with money I didn't even have, and. I in hopes that I would make my money back by um, having a few bands play and charging at the door. And uh, my, I threw a book release party, and it was a huge success. There was hundreds of people there. I had no idea who they were. I didn't even know if they were even there for the book. I, I, but I sold out of what I could afford to buy for it, and it was the coolest feeling ever. Um, so then I couldn't stop after that. Then I just kept, kept writing. Um, that led to Adoration for the Dead, uh, which is a collection of horror stories. And um, I self-published that also, and really tried to um, figure out what I was doing at that point, you know, working with software and stuff and making it look a little more pro. And then um, that kind of got put away after a while. It was no longer available for a bit, and I was doing a bunch of comic book scripts, and I was doing some, uh, some film scripts work even, a bunch of stuff that never saw the light of day. And then uh, I ended up becoming the art director for Source Point Press, which is um, like a small indie publishing company, and um, I decided to re-release Adoration for the Dead and uh, clean it up a little bit, put it back out there. And then ever since, I've just been involved with a ton of titles. Uh, I've done a bunch of short stories for anthologies, uh, Alter Egos, and uh, Feast of the Dead, which is a big zombie apocalypse collection, um, all sorts of good stuff. And then uh, most recently, we were putting together this book called Lycan Lore. It's a big, huge collection of werewolf stories. In fact, it comes out tomorrow. Um, we set it to uh, tie in with the blood moon. Tomorrow's the big blood moon, so uh, we wanted to come out that day. And I was um, editing it and uh, working on, you know, getting all the artwork for it too. So it's got illustrations, poems, and short stories. And I'd been working on a short story for it, but I got completely carried away with my short story. And it was really supposed to be last minute. I was supposed to just kind of whip something out really fast, throw it in the book, and really just wanted to focus on other people's you know, submissions and cleaning them up and working with them. But um, I got really into my story. It ended up uh, kind of getting away from me. And the next thing you know, it was way too long to even include in one lore. So um, it ended up being its own novella, and I was able to put it out quite a bit earlier than like in lore. It's been out for almost a month, I think, uh, maybe three weeks. So um, 
it's been off to a running start for, for sure because I ended up my story was really ambitious and way too ambitious for a short story and uh, I ended up just really fleshing it out. I didn't want to cut any corners with it. I was really into it, and um, I'm the better for it. I'm so glad that I took my time and did it right. I mean, took my time. I rushed. I really did rush, but I didn't cut any corners. I didn't try to make it short. I didn't cut out content. If it needed something, I put something there, and it really um, turned out well. I'm, I'm actually surprised. Look, I go back and read it now, and I don't, I don't even recognize it as my own writing. I'm just infatuated with the storyline. So that's I'm, I've never actually felt that way about anything that I've done. So, <laughs> so that's good. So the, Josh's writing was so good it put him into a fugue state, and he didn't even remember writing. Right. Yeah. That's great. That's not frightening. Perfect. That's that's not disconcerting. <laughs> All right. So, um, what when did you uh, what year roughly did you return to Michigan? Ah, uh, uh, dates. I'm terrible with those. Let me think. Um. 2007, 2007, okay. yeah, and uh, in I actually had no intention of staying here for very long, but um, now I'm kind of here for good. <laughs> uh, I ended up, um, I was just in between jobs, do, I was working retail, uh, doing whatever I could, kind of um, looking for the next illustration gig, but um, I didn't expect to find anything here, and uh, I ended up finding something here. I ended up getting married, having a son, and now I'm just, I'm really stoked to be, uh, that, uh, that I'm here. I was never really excited to be part of Michigan until now. Now I love being part of Michigan. There's such an untapped creative community here that um, I love seeking out, finding, becoming part of, finding out all these great projects going on across the state, uh, and helping kind of, uh, I don't know, help each other, lift each other up. People's, you know, outside the state need to recognize all the talent that's right here in this state. Um, I blame the weather. I, mean, I think there's a lot of creative people here because, you know, it's, there's a lot of snow outside, so we had nothing else to do. <laughs> so we all became writers and artists and whatever. Um, but it's cool. It's really cool. There's a lot of great things here in Michigan, and I'm proud proud to be here. Excellent. And then also, we're going to give a thank you to your lovely wife, Bree, as part of the reason why you're staying here, so that we could have yeah. in all of our wonderful sketches and uh, fake gun shooting. So... Thanks a lot. Buddy. You're the best. So let's talk a little bit uh, about Source Point Press uh, and uh, Mr. Trico Lukens. Um, how did that collaboration come about for you guys? Well, he um, he originally approached me at a uh, horror convention. I was um, I was pushing some horror art work that I was doing, Nosferatu and the Living Dead, that sort of thing. I was doing I was taking public domain films and I was putting them, re-releasing them out on DVD, but with brand new covers, oil-painted covers that I did. Uh, films like The Brain That Wouldn't Die and The Corpus Ashes and, yeah, all that good stuff. And so I was there uh, doing that con and uh, pushing those, pushing Adoration for the Dead, and um, he uh, fell in love with my work. He was there, he bought some of my prints, and we talked for a long time, and uh, said that he had a comic book script ready to rock, and he had an artist back out on him. And he was looking to replace that artist and um, start, you know, from the beginning again. So, um, you know, I talked to him a little bit about the concept, and I enjoyed it. I really liked it. I liked the visual style that he wanted to go with for it, and he thought my work was pretty fitting. So um, from there, uh, I started working on uh, some concept art for Jack of Spades, the comic book series, which we later, you know, started together. And he was not exactly sure how he wanted to go about the publishing route, so he was going to be pitching it to other places. And so I started talking to him more about it, and I was like, you know, we could we could do this ourselves and be fine. You know, some of the publishers that are willing to take this are, you know, they're nothing special. We could totally make this happen by ourselves. It's a lot of work, but it's doable. And so uh, from there, we ended up forming SourcePoint Press together. And from then on, it just kind of grew um, I just started handling the art side of things, working with other artists on their titles, and uh, you know, working with the artwork and making sure it's ready for print. Uh, working with things like you know, bleeds and all the good technical stuff. And he became editor in chief and kind of oversees uh, like all of the writing submissions and decides what's going to be put out and what's not, all that good stuff. And uh, we've managed within 
a year and a half, we've put out about a dozen titles. So it's not too bad. Off to a good start. No, not bad at all, especially for, uh, I mean, really what equates to a sort of garage publishing company. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's great that, you know, a lot of, a lot of those kind of companies will start up and they'll release two to five things, and then they'll sort of burn out, or they'll lose no momentum, and then it's just, it's done from there. Yeah. Um, so it's really good to see there's like, you know, you guys are putting out a lot of content, and you're looking to, you know, create more stuff and bring more stuff out, because that's, that's how you create momentum. That's how you sort of create that, that groove to stay in all the time. Creation's kind of like an addiction for me. Um, I'm never happy with myself until the finished product exists. I will hate myself every day until the finished product exists. I loathe unfinished projects. It is just the bane of my existence. And I have so many of them because of, you know, being me and being an artist and attention deficit and all sorts of other things combined. There's so many things that I want to do and work on, and I'm constantly starting stuff and not finishing it. So I've made it my mission to kind of clean house and follow through and get stuff done. And we've managed to kick out some decent stuff as a result. Um, it's been been pretty fun. Uh, we tapped into, well, I've got a couple things with me here. Okay, go ahead. This, um, so this was our first anthology, which uh, introduced us to some fantastic authors. I was super stoked. And uh, at the time, I had just joined the um, Great Lakes Association of Horror Writers, which is a bunch of awesome horror authors from Michigan. And... Uh, it was really cool to become a part of that group because I got to meet a lot of people. And uh, a couple of them are in here. But then we also met a couple people from overseas that we've been working with like to this day. Um, tomorrow, in our new book, some of those people are going to be in that as well. And uh, also, probably the coolest person that we met through this anthology was uh, David J. Fielding. Um, he played Zordon in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers television. Yeah, he's... The nicest guy in the world, super cool, and a fantastic author, which most people would never know. Um, so it was really, really an honor to kind of get to publish some of his work, and uh, I've been working with him on stuff ever since. So um, he appeared again in the follow-up. We did a, uh, He did another awesome story for Alter Egos Volume 2, and um, I did uh, an illustration for it which was really fun because I got to kind of, you know, work with him closely on it and all that good stuff. So, yeah, his story was called uh, Dust. And it was a really, really cool take on, like, the superhero genre. And then from there, um, you know, we released this under the Source Point banner, so Adoration for the Dead. And uh, from there we went to uh, do some zombie stuff. We ended up getting so many amazing submissions for Feast of the Dead, uh, including some really famous um, zombie comic book artists and writers uh, involved. It was really, really cool, um, including Gary Reed, who uh, did the Dead World comic series, which has been going on since the 80s. It's like the longest running one ever. Um, he's got a story in here, and uh, um, it was just all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, one of the artists from um, Fanboys vs. Zombies, the comic book series, is in here. Really great stuff. And we ended up with so much content that we ended up putting out in two books instead of one. And uh, so Feast of the Dead Hors d'oeuvres has all sorts of neat things. Um, in, in addition to just stories, it's got all sorts of art and poetry and interviews. Um, I got to interview um, one of the actresses from The Walking Dead and uh, got an inter uh, interview with Bert Kurtzman in here. Just really, really good stuff. So from there, we started tackling some of the public domain um, bringing like, some of the lesser-known Poe stories to life uh, with all new illustrations from all these fantastic artists that we started meeting from not just Michigan but all over the world. And so uh, this was a cool collection that we did with all new art and illustrations for a bunch of really old stories that are fantastic that uh, didn't get the kind of fame that some of his other um, stories and poems did, you know, such as you know, The Raven and Mask of the Red Death, all that good stuff. So... Uh, really cool title. We started doing some public domain uh, comic book stuff, too. I'm a big fan of old pulp, pulp comics that you can't get your hands on anymore, and uh, a lot of those just didn't really get a fighting chance. They were printed once and never, ever seen again. So um, it's really cool and a lot of fun. It's like a neat little hobby for me to track those down and try to find the best existing copies left in the world and 
get these really high-res scans and then clean them all up, Photoshop away the tape and the rips and the crayon and all that good stuff and try to republish them like the day they, you know, the, were first printed. And uh, also, in, as a mission of mine, when I do that, is a big goal is to bring credit in writing for everyone involved in those stories for the first time. I was absolutely shocked at the 50s. In the 50s, they really didn't care who was writing the story, who was inking, who was lettering. Like, there's almost... I would say about half of the stuff, I, there was no credits printed in writing for some of the comic book work. It blew my mind. Um, if you weren't the cover artist or the guy doing the main story, then that was it. You didn't, they didn't care you know, who you were. So um, a lot of these people are, you know... Well, I mean, even, even then, I mean, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee were just dudes working for Marvel. I mean, today we hold them in reverence for everything that created, but... You're absolutely right. At the time when they were creating the stuff, it was just like, eh, get those two schmucks in the bullpen to whip us up more of that crazy shit they made. Yeah, there really were no household names as far as comic book creators. They weren't seen in that way that we did, you know, movie stars and uh, and major authors of novels and such. So um, I'd like to think it, we've really progressed to see comic books as a, a high art form by comparison, you know, um, to the 50s and such. But yeah, so lots of good stuff with SourcePoint Press, lots of cool things we've been up to. Um, we held our own convention for the first time, uh, which was kind of a test to see how it would go, and it turned out really well, so that was cool. Um, yeah, we're just growing every day. It's more or less just hard to keep up with, and of course, to fund. That's the big thing. Everything costs money to do, and uh, it's pretty small profit margin selling books and comics. It takes a really long time to pay yourself back for a single title even. Uh, yeah, it's it's tough. It's really, really hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially in the, the printed medium, which is has consistently been on a deathbed since the... Well, the deathbed, as everyone else likes to say, uh, since, you know, the invention of the computer. But that's just ridiculous. If there's something compelling enough and that's the only format you put it in, people will buy it in that format. Uh, it just has to be compelling enough to get them in there. So let's talk a little bit uh, about Rampant now, uh, the uh, the short story that grew too big for its short story status. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about what Rampart is about. So, yeah, um, this is the book right here. It's got what is it? It looks like a little Scottish wolf here from a uh, family crest. And oh, that cover's pretty great there, son. Thank you. <laughs> and so um, this is going to appeal to uh, kind of a variety of fans. Um, yes, it is a horror book, and yeah, it is done in my style of writing, but it's nothing like the other horror stuff I've done. It's not a gore fest. It's not a trashy. It's not very lowbrow. It's, I really went for um, a gothic horror classic uh, feel to it. So people who are fans of like old-school classic horror films, they... This is kind of for them, you know. There's something they would really enjoy. Um, I really put myself to the test when I wrote this, uh, as is something that I found in, in myself when I was writing uh, just a few stories ago. For alter egos, I had wrote a story um, called Osiris, and I wanted to tackle. Uh, and I didn't want to write what you know anymore. I wanted to tackle a subject I didn't know much about, and so um, I researched the crap out of Osiris so that I could tie in this really in-depth story that, uh, that takes place in, you know, Egyptian history. And uh, it was really fascinating. I learned so much, and it was amazing. Doing the research, it was like the story was creating itself. You know, I was finding my story in between the lines in history. And, uh, like, oh, this is what happened throughout history, but I'm seeing a different story explaining why it happened that way. And so um, Osiris was the first story I wrote that had a ton of real history in it. And then uh, from there, I decided when I wanted to write Rampant that I wanted to do something similar. I really, really wanted to um, to utilize real history, um, and I wanted to challenge myself by writing in a time that I didn't know and in a place that I didn't know. So uh, it takes place in 1790 in the Swiss Confederacy, which is, you know, later became... Wait, 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 hold on. Are you trying to tell me you, you weren't familiar with 18th century Swiss social politics? No, unfortunately. Shocking. Absolutely <laughs> shocking, sir. But I am a little bit now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was 
it was it took me a little while to come to that. It's like why, why there, why then? Um, my basis was the uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Love love the novel, and I am fascinated by uh, the locations that take place in that story. So. A uh, big part of that story takes place in Ingolstadt, which is in Germany, and then Geneva. Um, my story takes place in a small village um, just northeast of Geneva, in the, and it's called uh, it's called Colony. is actually the name of the city, uh, and it's kind of in between those two locations. And this is taking place simultaneously, uh, so it actually ties in really seamlessly with. Um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So it's one of those things where if you like Frankenstein and you know the book really well, you'll pick up on all sorts of cool little tie-ins and Easter eggs and things like that. Uh, the story is not about Frankenstein or his monster, but um, it involves uh, Henry Clerval really heavily, who is Victor's best friend. And um, so I go into his backstory a little bit. It's the main story, uh, main character in my story is his cousin. And um, it talks about a little bit about how Henry left this small village to move to Geneva, where people get rich. It's kind of like the New York of the area. You know, you left the small town to be somebody big, and how his father became a successful businessman while the rest of his family was left back in this small village. And, um, of course, werewolves. What does this have to do with werewolves? Um, I really wanted to tell a story, a kind of a fish out of water story for werewolves. So um, my werewolf uh, story revolves around a clan from Scotland, and that clan has left Scotland and moved to the Swiss Confederacy, and they have taken a great deal of wealth with them, and they kind of own most of this village. They've really set themselves up in a nice spot, and uh, it's really interesting because I got to kind of focus on not only people who speak French and German as their first languages instead of English, but also deal with how Scottish people speak English in 18th century and, uh, and their personal policies, what they bring back from Scotland, how you know their roots are they're very, very Scottish in the story. They haven't kind of uh, sped things up to you know, fit in with, um, with Switzerland at all. So it's really, really challenging, and, um, but I enjoyed thoroughly every bit of the research that I did to make sure that it's um, accurate. I also didn't want it to be too dry. Um, I took a couple notes from Stephen King, uh, who basically says, speak as plainly as you possibly can, you know. And it was hard for me. I tend to write in a really poetic way, and I don't word things in the way people would prefer to because of I love the English language, and I would rather it sound beautiful at the same time. I stripped a little bit of that away because there was so much content here. There's so much things the reader has to take in. I wanted to write plainly and simply and let the story do everything. And the story stands on its own two feet. I don't need to pretty it up with anything. Um, it's that rich. Uh, I was able to kind of find the origin of werewolves uh, using only real history. Real history from that country, real history from Scotland, uh, leading deep into roots from Norway uh, is really, really exciting, too. Everything throughout history fell into place in this story and, at the same time, ties directly into a completely fictional novel that we all know and love. So uh, it, it turned out really, really cool. It's a unique book. If you like history, you're going to love it. If you like Frankenstein, you're going to love it. If you like nothing else but werewolves or horror, you're still going to love it. You don't need to know anything about Frankenstein or history to understand this book and enjoy it. And uh, I think that's where I kind of succeeded on multiple levels. And it just feels a little bit more mature and sophisticated uh, you know, writing for me. Um, definitely a, a new level. The next thing I do will be very challenging, I think. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a little bit about the, the, the differences in the creative process from, uh, from Brutality Effect to Rampant. Uh, like, how, how did your personal sort of, uh, your system, your approach change between the two books? Sure. Um, with Brutality Effect, I, everything was straight out of my brain, and everything was based on emotions. Um, I would write, um, I would write from my dreams, my own experiences, and I would blend them all together so you can't tell the difference between the two. Uh, so Brutality Pact is a really bizarre book. It's really out there. I wanted to express ideas and use scenarios to get the reader to 
those ideas. Whereas now I find myself um, with this insane amount of notes. I'm sitting here jotting down all these different things that I really enjoy. Like as I'm reading through old letters that were written to people in the 1700s, I'm finding phrases that I really love and uh, the way they would phrase things. I'm, I'm finding uh, words that would be replaced with other words and making sure that I'm creating this system of rules for myself so that when I get into the writing, I'm, I'm blocking myself in and I don't accidentally use something too modern. Um, I'm finding that the more I read about history, the more fascinated I am by um, what could have been. All these opportunities for fantastic fiction lying deep within these these battles and these feuds and, and uh, all this fantastic stuff. Um, when I wanted to write a werewolf story, obviously um, I was really super fascinated by researching the werewolf trials that were really prevalent in in the Swiss Confederacy, actually. The Swiss were the first people to hold major, major werewolf executions. And uh, from there, they led to very well-documented, most people are really familiar with witch trials. Um, what they don't realize is that a lot of those witch trials came from werewolf trials. It started as a werewolf accusation, and by the time they tortured that werewolf confession out of the person, well, then they must have been a witch. So it, it just kind of shoved them into the witch category because they had to use black magic of some sort or, you, you know, sleep with some succubus from hell to get where they, you know, their abilities. Ah, oh, those so damn hellish succubi. They're always ruining shit for you. You really do. It's true. You can't get seduced by anything. I wonder. There. I wonder how nuts. many ends that dudes with gnarly beards were executed just because they had gnarly beards. You know what I'm saying? Like just like yeah, like at least with the witches, it was more subtle, and it was like, oh, well, I, I, I saw Abby Proctor kissing the devil, blah blah blah, uh, and and then you turn around, and it's just like that guy's beard is messed up. He has to be a werewolf. Uh, he's really athletic, and his beard is gross. He has back hair. Let's kill him. Yeah, let's kill that athletic guy with the beard, that piece of shit. They did some pretty horrible things to people uh, who they thought were werewolves. It was just insane. Uh, in fact, because I ended up with nothing for lichen lore, um, other than an illustration that I did for it, I ended up um, quickly writing a poem just so that I have something in that book tomorrow at, when it comes out. And it's, um, I ended up doing something based on history also. Uh, I wrote a poem called The Werewolf of Bedburg, which is based on one of the most lurid, fascinating trials ever recorded, very well recorded, um, of a man who was seen as a werewolf. And uh, in real life, the guy was probably crazy and did some really horrible things, but the amount of evidence they had mounted against him as to being a werewolf is actually... Just a, it's so amazing. It's enough to kind of uh, let you suspend your you know belief for a bit and kind of think for a second if it could have happened, if it was true. Uh, like for example, in that particular case, not only this guy like he ate like fourteen children, he was a total cannibal. But um, and they they found you know all sorts of body parts around his house and stuff. But there was a night when a wolf was attacking the village and they were able to kind of fight back and they injured the wolf and they cut off one of his paws. And uh, a few days later they saw the man and he was missing one of his hands. And th that was kind of the uh, the last straw right there. They, they knew it then. They knew it because they had all this other evidence on him, but they cut off the wolf's paw, and now the next day the guy only has one hand. It was there was just no explanation other than he was the wolf. So it was, it, and they still don't know to this day what um, really happened to his hand because he confessed to being a werewolf for the past 25 years. He had all this huge long backstory of how he became a werewolf, about this magical belt that Satan gave him, just crazy stuff. And uh, it's really it was really well documented. So um, there's pamphlets you can read about him today that talk about the trial and the execution and everything that took place, everything he said. It's fascinating stuff. Really, really cool. Man, it's too bad Law & Order didn't make a version like that. Swiss werewolf unit. That'd be the best. Are you kidding me? That'd be awesome. Benson and Stabler beating the shit out of some poor guy I think is a werewolf. <laughs> oh, I, I've watched that show every week. I'm not going to lie. And wait a minute. What's the creator of Law & Order's name? Dick Wolf. Oh, hey. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay, I think we figured it out. We have figured out why there's no werewolf. 
So uh, one of the things I really like to pa talk about on Talking to Tightrope, uh, the things that a lot of people don't like to discuss are challenges. And it's for every little, you know, a lot of the focus is always on the successes and all the, the triumphs and everything. And, uh, you know, failure and challenge, you know, failure sucks. Challenges can be absolutely brutal. Um, but we need to talk about them because that's where the successes are born out of. Uh, you know, I was talking with uh, web TV producer Jenny Powell last week on Talking the Tightrope. And, you know, she was part of Lonely Girl 15, and she was part of the Guild, and she was part of the Emmy-winning Lizzie Bennet Diaries. And everyone knew about that stuff, but they didn't know about, you know, the rough time she had in between Lonely Girl 15 and the Guild, where she's traveling other states and doing all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So being an artist, especially being a graphic artist in 2014, uh, that's tough, man. That that takes that takes some balls to want to dedicate yourself to that, and not only that, but you know, work hard to struggle and make a living out of that particular industry, um, which you're doing, which is great. Tell us, uh, tell us about some of the challenges of being a graphic artist in this day and age. Um, you know, what's what's the rough stuff? What's the stuff that a lot of people don't realize is there for someone who does that for a living? Oh. It's countless. Um, there's more bad than good sometimes, but luckily even the small amount of good is such a good feeling that it kind of outweighs the bad. Um, my biggest, one of my biggest challenges um, uh, doing freelance work is getting paid. Honestly, that's really, really hard. No matter what the agreement you can hammer out up front, uh, there's people I've been chasing for two years just uh, for small amounts of money that, you know, I just, I won't let it go for Pride's sake, um, but it's, God, it's Josh. I've got your five dollars in my wallet. Leave me alone, bro. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's nuts. Um, there's a lot of questioning yourself. Um, I question my abilities all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've wondered. No matter what you're good at, you always find people who are better at it. And because I do so many different things, it's really hard to master any one thing. So it seems like I'm able to beat down myself quite a bit when it comes to anything that I do. I'm like, no matter what it is, I'm able to find somebody who does it better. But it's good to know that they also can't do a lot of the other things that I do. So I'm kind of a, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. It's great when, it, when you need somebody who can not only pencil, ink, and color your comic, but also lay everything out and get it to the printers and work with files. It's great when somebody can hire you to draw, you know, your t-shirt design, but actually also send proper vector art that can be screen printed to the printers, you know, things like that. Most people can only do one or the other. They're really, really good at the technical side, or they're really, really good at, you know, the art side, and I work really hard at the technical side, which means that I'm not progressing on the art side as quickly as I expect myself to. You know, I was watching myself grow through college and become this great artist, and then I felt like there was this major plateau because I was forced to learn a whole bunch of graphic design stuff that I didn't focus on in college once I hit the job market and I realized they want a two for one deal nobody just wants to your art it's not enough you know they you need to be able to do everything and you know from concept to finished product so um, there's a lot of challenges in figuring out all that stuff lucky you know for me I'm really pig-headed and I won't stop until I've figured out how to solve a problem. <laughs> so uh, they can kind of put me in any job, and regardless of my comfort level, I'll tackle it not only to the best of my ability, but I'll improve myself no matter what the job is to make sure you know that I get it done right. And I just assume that I always do it wrong the first, second, and third time, so I like quadruple check everything I do. Um, so obviously dealing with people is really hard. Uh, my social skills kind of tank because I spend so much time cooped up at a work desk and then I deal with such a huge variety of clients. I'll get somebody who's just really precise about what they want and you kind of have to kind of uh, almost take a psychology degree to be able to please everyone because some people hire you and give you very little instructions based on what they saw of your work. They're like, I know what you're good at. I know what you do. So be yourself and I'll like it. Other people, they don't want you to be yourself at all. You are a tool that they need to use to get the job done and it needs to look like this. Regardless of what you're good at, you know, they know you're capable of this, then they will force you to do it. So it's getting to know, you know, them, their expectations. 
Um, like I said, getting to know the, the technical side of things. And, uh, and then dealing with rules. You know, once people think that working on indie stuff is, you know, not as cool or as exciting as working on licensed stuff, working on licensed stuff is a nightmare. <laughs> um, a great quote, uh, I met Clayton Crane recently, who's a really amazing comic book artist. Um, he does, instead of doing pencils, inks, or colors, he does everything. When he's on a title, he does the art. He is just labeled as art by Clayton Crane because he does incredible digital paintings. And uh, he's a classically trained artist working in that way, but in comics. So I met him, and I talked to him, and uh, I was talking to him a little bit about his process. And... Um, he said, you know, you're, you're here as a guest too, right? And I was like, yeah, my table's over there. He's like, well, that's great. You know, what are you working on? And I was like, oh, you know, just indie creator own stuff, nothing too exciting. And he's a, right now he's on Rye uh, for Valiant. And um, he said, man, he's like, I really hope that I get to do that someday. And I was so blown away. Here's somebody who did the best X-Force run ever. You know, they've done all sorts of fantastic work for Marvel. And here he was, uh, envious that I was doing creator-owned material. It, it, of course, there's a money difference here. He's getting paid much better. You know, creator-owned material, you're lucky if you get paid at all. Uh, and you got to really score big with image or whatever. Yeah, basically what you're saying is sometimes you chase yourself for your money, yeah. Right, right. So uh, I was just totally taken aback. But in my experiences of, like, the bigger the job, the more trouble you find. Uh, I worked on multiple... Transformers licenses for uh, for Hasbro, June G1, Transformers Prime, and then the first three movies. And so because oh, the first, first of all, let me offer you my condolences on working on movie properties. Ah, uh, nightmare. So here I have, not only do I have to deal with all these rules, like, oh, you know what? Uh, by the way, we need to do all this artwork from the films, but we didn't ask the car companies if it was okay if we did this. So all those cars that we got actual car companies involved in don't show any of them. Okay, got it. Yeah, Megan Fox didn't sign off on this. Um, don't use her anywhere. Actually, don't use any of the actors anywhere. Like, okay, so I'm just drawing bots. No problem. Except that, you know, they look like a total mishmash of who somebody puked up robotic parts. They don't make any sort of sense. I'm here, I'm, like, freeze-framing, you know, screenshots from a Michael Bay film trying to figure out what it even looks like. That alone was frustrating. But I can do that. No problem. Now, were you able to see the robot parts behind the explosions that were going on in the first 40 layers of the ground, or...? I you think the robot parts are exploding themselves. They are literally... They make no sense. Nothing connects to anything. It's just a bit... It looks like noodles. You get up close, it is like a bowl of noodles moving. Everything's just moving. Nothing makes any kind of physical sense. Uh, but then there's this whole problem of Michael Bay wanted to personally approve every single image. And he wouldn't let anybody else do it. He had to be him. Now you're working on his schedule, and you don't get paid. In fact, if he doesn't like something that you did, you don't get paid for it at all. You don't get paid for your time. Wow. So um, I waited seven or eight months before um, the product had to be released, and the companies had to force him to uh, sign off on all my stuff at once. Uh, so I waited about a year before I got paid for doing what I thought was really exciting, big license. Transformers work, and here I can't chase them down for money that they owe me, which is not very much. It's not much more than what I would get for an indie project. You know, for somebody who's truly, you know, appreciative of uh, my involvement and, you know, would follow up with pay right away or within 30 days or even half up front. No, Michael Bay was a nightmare, just a total nightmare. So, yeah, the successes are not always uh, seen that way. You know, you forget. You forget to kind of look back and be proud of where you've gotten because um, of the stress level. It just increases and uh, becomes a lot less fun. Yeah, you know, if somebody would just pay me to let me do my own thing, I'd probably kick out four times as much work because I wouldn't be waiting on so-and-so to email me back. I wouldn't be waiting on so-and-so's approval of whatever. It's really hard to uh, manage your time when you rely on so many other people. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of frustrations with basically doing other people's stuff for them. It's really what being an illustrator is. Oh, so basically a damned if you do, damned if you don't art form. 
Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's great. It's always good. We uh, lift people's emotions up here about their artistic <laughs> prospects on Talking the Tightrope. We're here to make sure you feel as sad as possible about your choice to go into professional art. <laughs> so something I, I wanted to ask, uh, as a professional artist, um, there was, when I was growing up and they were starting to use, starting to use computer technology more, especially in comic books, um, there was a, a very strong schism developing where there were fears by artists on all levels. So pencilers, uh, colors, ink, um, even the letters, they were getting worried that computer technology and the tools that it presented were basically going to eliminate their, you know, their, the need for them to create any kind of art or sort of add on to the process. Um, now, obviously, it's 2014, and comic book artists are not going anywhere. They, the, the form didn't die out. You still have colorists. Uh, even letterers, there are those who prefer traditional, classical, physical lettering, um, as opposed to, say, Comic Sans, probably the worst <laughs> font of the world. Um, but as an artist, and, and you were growing up around that time, too, does the explosion of technology, do you find that it assists your ability to create art? Uh, does it hamper it? Are there aspects where it helps and then it hampers? Uh, what is it like from the perspective of an actual professional artist? Uh, that's a really excellent question. Um, I think there's some debate about this even in the art community, but I found that technology, other than being uh, a bit of a time and cost hindrance to the artist as far as like keeping up to date, buying new software, learning, teaching yourself because, you know, I don't get to go to college for a living. Um, that's frustrating and difficult, you know, when you are trained in a classical way, you know, to draw and paint. Um, but I found that technology is just, it's really, I think, challenged artists and really pushed them to the next level. Um, if a program allows you to do more, well, then you're going to do more. You're, there's just no way that you can't. And uh, a perfect example is coloring. If you look at some of the colors in comic books even up to early 90s compared to now. Now when you open a book, you find that the colorists are putting about four times more uh, time and effort into it than they were back then. They were limited by their programs, and now they're not. Anything's possible. So why not do this gorgeous painterly-like coloring? And uh, everybody's challenging each other by trying to top it. So I'm finding that... Um, the boost in technology is creating more gorgeous comic books. Everything's so much richer. I think for the first time ever, comic book readers, average comic book readers, not major you know, comic book readers, are starting to really pay attention to colorists. They're starting to recognize their work, know them by name. That's unheard of. Nobody cared about the colorists before. It was uh, fill this area with yellow, fill this area with blue. Now they uh, make or break a comic book. They really do. And they're working so hard at that. Um, to bring people something beautiful and rich, and technology allowed them to do that because it's not it's not efficient to paint comic books. So um, doing something digitally, but letting allowing it to be painterly that's that's incredible. Um, I think that the more this stuff progresses, the more technology progresses, we're going to cut some corners. Like I find myself doing it all the time. Can I? you know, do a photographic, realistic painting. Yes, I can. It's Is it worth my time doing so? Not necessarily. Not You know, the ends always justify the means. If the product looks good and I get it out by the deadline, nobody cares how I did it. So if I find that my pieces become a bizarre mixture of traditional and Photoshop, so be it. I, I'm not trying to prove something to myself with each job. If I know I can do it, you know, if I tackle it, I've seen myself do it, great. Now, as soon as I've done that, my next thinking is, how do I streamline this? How do I make this efficient and quick so that I can get it out and keep on producing more content? It seems like a way where you cut down on people's jobs, um, but in reality, I think you're cutting down on people's time so that they can do more jobs. And by doing that, the creators are putting out double, triple the amount of content they were able to in the past, and as a result, it's keeping arts alive. I really think that the fact that a person can tackle three titles in a month uh, in any given you know, comic book format, that's, that's amazing. And because of that, we're making sure that comics are still around. So um, I think the jobs are still there. Uh, and, uh, just people need to hurry up 
you know, train yourself, get to know everything inside and out so you can streamline it, be efficient, kick out quality product twice as fast. Not so that you can make less money, but so that you can go on and make another book in the same amount of time, you know, that it took to do one, you could do two. And as a result, you're probably going to get to paid the same, but uh, there's a lot more content out there for people to enjoy. And I think that's really exciting. And I think it goes for film. It goes for, I mean, every type of art form. Uh, utilizing technology has allowed us to keep the arts really thriving. Very cool. Well, and it's, it's always good to hear that, you know, there, it looked to me like there was a system of adaptation, and really that's always the optimal thing. Um, like, yes, of course, there's a risk that, that something will get affected or cut, uh, you know, that, that different artists might lose their jobs. It looked to me a lot more like that fear was was abated. They were able to actually figure out how to adapt to the new sort of landscape and the things that allowed them to do. And I absolutely agree. For better or for worse, content uh, quantity has just exploded, and that's everywhere. I mean, that's with my stuff in web TV, with Internet video, um, you know, it just completely exploded. We're, we're starting to see for a while TV – Television storytelling was kind of like the fourth stringer, and movies were where it was at. And then movies started falling more and more into tent poles 90% of the time, 80% of the time. Uh, and so suddenly you start seeing this wave towards television, which exploded. And there's all these great stories and, and more intricate storytelling that you'd never seen before when it was just like, you know, laugh track this, or this particular drama does the same thing over and over again. Um, so I, I just adaptation is always the optimal uh, effect of new technology, and I'm glad to see that at least for professional art, uh, that definitely seems to be the case at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And uh, the trick is just making sure everybody challenges themselves personally to keep the quality level up with their quantity. You know? <laughs> That's the hard part, right? I mean, when you have the ability to kick out a lot of quantity, uh, Quality, it's easy for quality to drop, but um, it's it's hard. I, and I know, even with my stuff, I have to do so much. You know, um, the the value of the work has gone down, it seems like. So I'm getting paid very, very little, but I have to keep, you know, a ton of things coming my way. So if I keep up on top of it, well, then I'll be okay. But as a result, I'm rushing myself constantly, and I never get to kind of really take my time and do it beautifully. So I'm always trying to find a way to put out the same level of quality in a quicker time rather than, you know, bring my own quality down to keep up with quantity. And uh, that goes for you know, everybody. Having digital platforms to publish a book, having uh, a million different ways to, you know, to edit footage and, and put out videos and stuff like that, it's just, I think, uh, it challenges each of us artistically and creatively to, um, you know, stay true to what we really, our vision, and not just worry about product, but you know, keep the quality up, make sure it, it really did come out the way you envisioned, you know, and that's uh, that's good, you know, it keeps challenging us. Now that there's such saturation in the market, now everything, no matter what it is creatively, is so saturated, we're forced to compete. We're back to, okay, great, now why me? You know, why them? Why so-and-so? And so you you just thrive, you know, to, you know, you try really hard to put out better, you know, better quality stuff. Yeah, and then there's always getting your voice heard. That's 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 a whole different <laughs> subject. If everybody's voice <laughs> was heard Josh, equally, no one wants to hear your voice. Yeah, right, right. If everybody's voices were heard equally, then only the best would be taken notice of. But unfortunately, I see it every day when amazing stuff, people doing really incredible things, and um, just uh, it's not getting noticed as it should. And a lot of people are noticing a lot of crap, you know, because that's the crap is screaming the loudest. Yo, look at me. And uh, it's hard. It's hard because now all of a sudden everybody needs to be a marketing whiz and everybody needs to, you know, spend just as much time on pimping out their stuff as they do creating it. And that's not what we're made for. That's not what creative people are made for. We're, we're made to create. It's it's uh, definitely still an ongoing struggle. There's always something. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that never went down. It's just, uh, you know, the, that challenge never went anywhere. That's always been there. Um, but with the like the democratization of communication with the internet uh, as like the supreme communicating technology of our time, uh, it's it's where everyone can go and see everyone's stuff, uh, and absolutely it just becomes a, a sea of material that you have to wade through. Now um, you had brought up something earlier about how the the jobs are are low paying, but you have to get a lot of them to sort of 
to, to make it and you're able to do so. Does it feel to you from your perspective like uh, it's just the pay has always been that low? Does it feel like the pay has dropped or, or gone down in some respects from jobs that you had done uh, you know, years before? Uh, what, what does it feel like? What does the economy of professional art feel like to you right now? That's such a, a good question. I, I wish... I bring the heavy, son. I bring the heavy. I wish that I was, you know, already in the industry for decades before this because there's such an obvious big change that's happened right now, you know, within the past decade that if I'd been doing this for 30 years, I'd be able to really step back and see whether the change is good or bad and, and where, where certain things have, you know, have become, I don't know, worse. Mm -hmm. um, but I, what I'm seeing is that the pay... The pay is low because the amount of people producing things went up. So, you know, when you when you have thirty publishers, um, you, know, you know, suddenly you go from two tiers of publishers to ten tiers of publishers. You know, instead of major three ones, there's a major thirty one. So, you're getting um, your your voice is only getting heard by whatever one took notice that's closest. So that might be a low tier that's only paying this rate and uh, there are publishers out there, there are artists out there who are so desperate to hear their voice heard that um, they'll do anything. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll take any job. And so a lot of small publishers are jumping on those people and, and utilizing them because they, it's a symbiotic relationship. They need them to put out cool, good content that makes, that creates a value for their product. The value doesn't exist automatically. And people can get so much for free now. If you want to read crappy comics, oh my gosh, the internet's amazing. You can read for free forever. But if you want to, you know, start applying a, a number value to your content, well, it's you better impress me, you know. So it's a uh, it's a struggle for both the artists and the writers and the um, the people who have to bring the content to the viewers. How did they find? How do they make sales? You know, when there's so much for free. Um, by getting good content, how do people, you know? How do you get somebody who creates good content? You pay them. Unfortunately, artists have kind of, I think, given up on that. They know the pay will come later. Yes, I am going to do some free stuff. That I've I've come to that conclusion myself. And I know tons of artists that are on the same playing field as me, and they'll they'll never do anything for free. And uh, I, I do stuff for free all the time. Not, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Please don't uh, ask me to work on any of your stuff <laughs> for anybody watching. Um, but no, it's true. Like I've, I've, I have to weigh everything. It's like, okay, what do I have time for? How do I sneak it in? Is it worth my time? What do I get from it? You know, and um, and it might not always be pay, but uh, oftentimes it's you know good exposure. I, I realize that's soul crushing, you know, for an artist trying to make a living. Um, but once you do that you start climbing the tiers. It's just there's so many more of them now that you, you've got to constantly be putting out content that's uh, good until somebody notices. It's like, it's like Twitter. You know, your first tweet's going to get buried. But you also don't want to do so many repeated tweets that nobody pays attention to you because they're sick of seeing you tweet. So you've got to time your tweets, and you've got to keep putting stuff out there until people notice. They're like, oh, hey, that guy. I think I noticed him five minutes ago, or twenty minutes ago, or five days ago, and uh, art's kind of like that now. Um, instead of the job being cut and dry, simple, people have to weigh in so many more factors uh, in the "what's in it for me" category, other than money, and uh, it's difficult, really, really difficult. And you know, the money's nice because it helps you pay for things like you know, say rent or car payments or insurance yeah. or like groceries or any of that, any of that lame stuff that isn't art. Thanks a lot, food. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it uh, for this evening. Again, my guest this evening was Mr. Joshua Werner, the uh, artist, actor, and author of the book Rampant. Rampant is actually available right now. We're going to have links in the description box uh, on the YouTube archive version. Uh, we'll put up links to SourcePoint Press and his other material. That way, if you're so inclined, go ahead, check out his wares, uh, and see if his uh, his work might catch your eye enough to perhaps uh, purchase some product. You could actually pay this artist right here to be an artist. That's pretty sweet. You got this show for free. You can get the you can, you can pay a couple bucks for the art. Come on now, come on. Right. Uh, so 
Thank you again, Mr. Josh, for joining us this evening. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a blast uh, getting to listen to myself go on about everything for hours. <laughs> hey, well, and anyone who has extended conversations with me, that's all I ever do. <laughs> so uh, I actually made sure to curtail myself, but this would go eight hours, which is <laughs> the hangout limit. Uh, you and I could, uh, we could, yeah, we could go all day, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, there's a reason why I didn't bring up Rob Liefeld. <laughs> it's like 51 hours right there. That's jeans and shoulder pads and guns we do not need to get into. <laughs> Uh, so my guests coming up uh, next week, we actually will have Mr. Steve Bosworth from over in the UK. Uh, he is actually the guy who created the vampire veneers um, for our leading ladies in Vampirism Bites, uh, which was both of our Bells and our Dracula. Um, that's a crazy story of a guy who literally just dropped me a, an inbox message on YouTube uh, and asked if I wanted fangs for my vampire web series. Uh, absolutely crazy story. So join us uh, next week, Tuesday. It will actually be a the live show will be 3 p.m. because that'll make it 8 p.m. in England. But we'll have the archive version up immediately, uh, and we'll let everyone know once that's up as well for those that are in the uh, United States. Also this week for Tightrope on um, Thursday, we will be re-releasing season one of Vampirism Bites, uh, the complete season one as a single video. There's been some remastering, cleaning up some of the um, technical flaws and issues that I had when I was, you know, it was 2010, I was less experienced and I had weaker software. Um, just trying to clean stuff up and just trying to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Vampirism Bites. Um, my friend uh, Josh here who played Dennis will appear starting in next week's episode. So you get to see some uh, some of that their acting art that this guy's all talking about or whatever, and uh, he did not he did not shave his head in the middle of it, um, thankfully. So we were able to get everything we needed shot. So until next week, I am James as usual. I am the man to blame here at Tightrope. Thanks once again to artist, actor, author of the new book Rampant, Mr. Joshua Werner, for joining us tonight. And uh, if I've told any bad jokes or puns that made you sad, well then that's how you know it's me. Thanks for joining us. Any minute now. I just clicked the stop button like five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>